It's a warm reception to our studios here in Serekunda. This is TV News with me, Sarah Kamara. In the headlines tonight, Scorpion's arrival delayed. APRC calls on Barrow to revisit agreement sanctioning deployment of Senegalese troops in Fonye. Consortium of CSO's Election Work Committee issues recommendation as legislative election loom. Jokad with Tambana circumcision tech center stage. And on the international scene, closing arguments begin in 1987 Sankara killing trial. As Russia Ukraine tensions escalate, EU scramble to secure gas supply. US Senate close to deal on a bill to sanction Russia over Ukraine tension. Those were the headlines, and now the news in detail. The Gambia Football Federation regret to inform the general public that there is a new development with regard to the arrival of the senior national football team Scorpions due to logistical reason. Consequently, a new arrival date will be communicated to the public in due course. While we advise everyone to stand down for the time being, we deeply apologize for any inconvenient cause, read GFA communication. Meanwhile, reports monitored by Star TV Sport Department has indicated that the national team and delegation are set to arrive tomorrow by midday instead of today, as there was an offer to transport 153 people today, but the organizing committee do not intend to leave anyone behind, so a bigger aircraft is being sent to accommodate them. APRC has called on President Adam Barrow to revisit the agreement that sanctioned the deployment of Senegalese troops in Fonye. Darocham reports. The former ruling party also sympathized with the people of Fonye for the distress and trauma caused to them by last week's suit out between the Senegalese security and the MFDC separatists. The APRC wants President Adam Barrow and his government to treat the matter with the urgency it deserves so as to bring back peace and calm in the Fonyi region. We want to urge the President, His Excellency Adam Barrow, to treat the incident with urgency to restore peace and tranquility in the region and review the agreement that led to the Senegalese troops stationed in Fonyi, APRC said in a statement. APRC gave the people of Fonyi and Gambians the assurances that the party is with them at all times. We want to assure the people of Fonyi and Gambians at large on flinching support at all times. May we attain a lasting peace and security in our homeland, said the statement signed by APRC's Director of Media, Duduja. Meanwhile, the APRC has extended condolences to the families of the fallen soldiers and on any life lost. We are extending our heartfelt condolences to the families of the soldiers and any loss of life caused by the unfortunate incident. We wish speedy recovery to those injured and we pray for the departed souls to eternal peace and be granted Jenna. Commiserated the party. Reporting for Star TV News, I am Dada Cham. As legislative election looms at the horizon, a consortium of Gambian CSOs and election work committee have issued a set of recommendations to the IEC political parties and security apparatus for the successful conduct of the poll. Jacqueline Colley has more details in this report. It's little over two months close to the legislative elections and efforts are being reinforced to ensure the successful conduct of the polls. The Election Watch Committee, which comprised of Peace Ambassadors de Gambia, Youth Parliament and activists the last month, journeyed backwards to the December general election by engaging fellow domestic observers and CSO groups that were instrumental in the presidential election. The idea was to constructively engage the Gambia CSOs on the opportunities and lessons drawn from their observation of recent electoral activities. The post-election reflection session, held at a local hotel in January of last year, gathered 15 domestic observers and CSOs. Profit recommendations to the IEC, political parties, and security for consideration as the legislative elections loom. The Election Watch Committee and CSOs pre present at the session commended the IEC for what they said, the efficiently conducted presidential election, the political parties for being law-abiding and utilizing the prescribed legal process to pursue complaints and security officials for their valued service. 
There was a convergence of opinion at the session that IEC has delivered to the country's expectations in terms of providing a transparent, free, fair and peaceful election. But it appears much needs to be done, as explained by Honorable Omar Cham on Monday at African Princess Hotel whilst delivering a communique on the Election Watch Committee post-presidential election reflection session. That IEC were able to deliver up to the country's expectations in terms of providing a transparent, free, fair, and most importantly, a peaceful elections. However, the consortium of Gambian CSOs and the Election Watch Committee proffered the following recommendations to the IEC, political parties, and the security to consider ahead of the April 2022 parliamentary elections. He added, The first set of recommendations, of course, goes to the IEC that the IEC should further break down polling stations to avoid long queuing and prolonging the voting process which may result in demotivating the voters. That the IEC should encourage and make arrangements for political party agents to be able to observe the transfer of ballot boxes to the coalition centers to promote transparency. The communique also seeks to impress on political parties and security apparatus to put their houses in order. The IEC should reverse the restructuring, the structuring of the electoral calendar to ensure adequate time between the nomination period and the campaign period to resolve potential nomination issues for candidates. The IEC should revise, uh, the, uh, the, uh, although the public scrutiny is not a requirement of law, in the interest of citizen participation and transparency, the IEC should provide adequate time for individual scrutiny of the candidate nomination documents. And last but not the least on the IEC, we believe the IEC should reconsider the process of allowing those on official duty and not just security officers and polling officers assigned to a polling station the opportunity to vote. This includes observers, the media, and party agents participating in the electoral uh, participating in the election process. We also believe that political parties should adequately train political party agents on the procedures of election day voting and appropriate actions to take in instances of wrong procedures observed. Meanwhile, participants on Monday's event proffered important recommendations uh, during the during the entire election process. There was a time that parties sent in their campaign itineraries. Okay. And these campaign itineraries were given to the Commission. And there was a date set where all political parties with their administrative secretary would come and defend uh, that campaign itinerary. That is the date we are supposed to have the meetings and stuff so that we don't have the clash in the, when we get into the campaign proper. And these are things that we realized when we went to the campaign. So most of us were in coalition, some of us were in alliances, and we went to ensure that we have the campaign done. And during the time when we went during the, in this campaign, we saw some of these problems, whereas Party A will be having a meeting while Party A is supposed to be in that, in that very venue. Party A is still there. And those clashes happened. At the end of the day, we are just able to manage because we do not want any post-election violence. And at the end of the day, it was like a consensus building by political parties to ensure that that peace reigns. If not, it's going to cause problems. So my, 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 my reservation here is for the IEC to take these things very, very serious. Because at the end of the day, if it's not put into consideration, it will cause conflict. And now that we are heading to the parliamentary elections, and I think some of these things are coming up again. And I think IEC, IEC should take note of this. This is my true intervention sound. Duruja is APRC Director of Media. I want to reflect, starting with the nominations. I want to take Banjul as a region and as an example. Let the IEC consider a different process, even if it's going to be unique for Banjul, the way nominations are accepted based on the voter population of Banjul. And the trend they use is like first come, first serve basis. When you have uh, candidates in alphabetical order, that they have to submit their nominations at the IEC, people who endorse you. So if you have too many political parties and a lot of independent candidates, Bandu will disqualify 
lot of aspirants to contest in the presidential election based on first come, first serve basis. So I would urge the IEC to look into the mechanism what they would do with Banjo. And when most people are also moving away from Banjo, going to settle in other regions, we might continue to have that as a very big challenge. So we should reflect on that and it must be a lesson learned for it not to repeat. Another point is about registration. I won't really talk about that. Jacqueline Colley for Star TV News. Harvests have been completed in Jokadu and this time of the year provides the opportunity for several families to initiate their male children for boyhood and subsequently manhood. Our Omar Job attended one of these initiation ceremonies in Tambana and he put together this report. Harvest season is that time of the year when many families in Jokadu have the resources to finance the expensive initiation of their children into boyhood and later manhood. Jokadu Tamana was recently the scene of an exciting initiation ceremony where multitudes of villagers turned out to participate in the circumcision of several children. As part of the harvest season circumcision, clans in the village will circumcise children due for the rite of passage and this year it was Sulas Kabilo comprising the Dabo Kunda and the Jame Kunda that took the center stage. Edward Jame is the alcalo of Tamana. <laughs> Ben <laughs> Another villager bought a second reiterated the huge departure from tradition when it comes to male circumcision. <laughs> Mfamara Fofana is from Jokado Dasilame and as the overseer of the circumcise in Jokado, he is also disappointed that things have changed radically when it's come to male circumcision. <laughs> Jokaru Tamana is meanwhile 42 kilometers from Bara and 2 kilometers from the Bara Kerawan Highway. For Star TV, this is Omar Jo. Those were the local stories. We'll be back with international news after the short break. South Africa Global is the first and biggest private estate developer in the Gambia and presence in seven other African countries. We take pride in leading innovation in all spheres of real estate sector in the Gambia and beyond. As such, we are launching the development of the first smart and modern office and retail towers in the Gambia called Taft Twins. The Taft Twins is located in the heart of the Carnifin institutional area and 10 minutes drive away from Banjo. Taft Twins is designed to have five floors of office spaces ranging from 50 square meters to over 1,000 square meters with two elevators, central air conditioning, 24 hours electricity and water supply with the ground floor reserved for banking, supermarket, restaurant and coffee shop. For your bookings and reservations, please call now on 376-2333 or 
0242-222-2333. Thank you. Yunus English School. For quality and affordable education, look no further. Yunus English School has what you've been looking for. Yunus English School is a leading institution in the Gambia with nursery, lower basic, upper basic, and senior secondary education with magnificent teaching and learning facilities. Yunus English School has highly qualified and experienced teaching staff preparing students for university and beyond. Yunus English School is an institution with distinct academic excellence and the school operates not only in the usual five days a week but six days a week Mondays to Saturdays breaking a remarkable record on credit our coverage for all our students contact Yunus English School today to register your children on 7781443 or 7070091 or still on 9249426 better still you can email Yunus English at yahoo.com at Yunus English School, excellence is a priority without compromise. The Red Cross Emblem The unauthorized use of the Red Cross Emblem in the Gambia is illegal and punishable by law. Did you know that in the Gambia, only the Gambia Red Cross Society and the medical services of the Gambia Armed Forces with specific restrictions are allowed to use the Red Cross emblem? Did you know that the use of the Red Cross emblem by commercial entities such as hospitals, pharmacies, health posts, private and public properties is also considered as misuse of the emblem? That its misuse could threaten Red Cross missions and put humanitarian workers at risk? The emblem is fully protected by the international humanitarian law and the laws of the Gambia and its misuse by any other party leads to its violation which is sanctioned with penalties. The Gambia Red Cross utilized the emblem to signify our promise, neutrality and impartiality to provide assistance to all people in need regardless of race, color, belief, religion or political affiliation. It serves as a symbol of protection and assistance for the Red Cross teams while to those we serve it is a symbol of hope. Let's know, respect, and protect the Red Cross emblem. In a country always thirsty for more, a team of superheroes with special powers unite to redefine the way we are connected. Big Bob Warren Bagas steps up your communication with the DOK service, giving you 1,000 minutes of talk time to one special person for $150 only. Valid for one month. Enjoy your talk time. Type SUB and send by SMS to 135 to activate the TOK service. Afrisol got office with the power to change the world. Afrisol is setting trends once again. I'm sure you still love WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, and Viber. Your favorite GSM operator, Afrisol, knows this. That's why you can now enjoy more at the same price. Activate the social media bundle and be online for 24 hours for ten dollars only. Hello. Activate the social media bundle for ten dollars only and receive 40 megabytes. Where Africell goes, no, no, nobody dares to follow. Dares to follow. Welcome back after that short commercial break. If you're just joining us, this is Tati V News from our studios here in Serikunda. Now we take a closer look at the international stories. Closing arguments have begun in the trial of more than a dozen defendants accused over the assassination of Burkina Faso's former president Thomas Sankara. The African icon was killed with 12 others in a coup in 1987. Among those accused of his mother are former president Bres Kampawari and his close aide General Gilbert Denderi, a former head of the Allied Presidential Security Regiment. Al Jazeera's Nicholas Hake reports from Ouagadougou. In the heart of Ouagadougou, a tribute to a Pan-African icon and a symbol of strength and defiance, Burkina Faso's president, Thomas Sankara, was killed in a coup 25 years ago, long before Elda Kouama was even born. And yet his murder trial is important and significant to her. It comes at a time of uncertainty following Monday's coup. We need justice so we can even believe in, the, in a possible future. This has been only a few days that we are in this uh, situation 
You know, we, we have no government, let's say that. We have no institutional laws that are stable now. So we are just asking ourselves if we can just hope that what has been started will continue. So I think it won't affect. This is what I think, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Last Monday, as lawyers in Thomas Sankara's murder trial were about to give their closing statements, the hearing was abruptly adjourned. It happened after Colonel Damiba arrested the president and took power in a coup. In a televised statement, he said justice will follow its course. Their trial is now set to resume. In the dock of the accused is Colonel Damiba's former commander, Gilbert Diendere. He, along exiled former leader Blaise Compaoré, are accused of being behind Sankara's murder. Everyone turns they want the truth. But actually, they want their version of the truth and not the reality of what happened. Shortly after Compare was ousted from power in a popular uprising in 2014, Diendere staged a coup. It's in this hotel in the wealthy neighborhoods on the outskirts of Ouagadougou that heads of states from the West African bloc ECOWAS met with General Diendere. They held talks, ended the coup, which led to his arrest. This was seen as a success for ECOWAS in restoring democracy to this country. Three coups in one year, ECOWAS is now facing an institutional and regional crisis. Satirical cartoonist Damien Getz fears the latest coup could delay Sankara's trial. About the death of Sankara, we all feel like we know what actually happened, who did what, and who was where. The question here is, are we going to be able to purge the current political situation and bring justice so we can move on? For people like Kuwama, leaving the past behind also means forging ahead into an uncertain future. Nicholas Hawk, Al Jazeera, Ouagadougou. The standoff between Russia and Ukraine has Europeans worried about gas supply. A third of Europe's natural gas comes from Russia, and if there is a war, Europe would have to turn to other providers. EU leaders have been clear that a Russian act of aggression against Ukraine would have dire consequences for President Putin and his country. It would mean an end to his hopes of bringing the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline on time, depriving him of tens of billions of dollars in revenue and depriving the EU of hundreds of billions of cubic meters of Russian gas. Al Jazeera's Dominic Kane reports from Germany. This is the Amur natural gas installation in central Russia, one of many such plants whose product is piped to destinations in Asia and Europe, all of which generates an export revenue of more than $200 million a day for the provider Gazprom. The greatest single market is Germany, closely followed by other European countries. Cumulatively, 128 billion cubic meters of gas flows to the EU each year, representing around a third of its annual imports. But what would happen if the Ukraine crisis became a war and all of this was suddenly switched off? There could be an interruption of gas supplies. However, the Russian government should weigh carefully whether they really want that. While it's possible to put Europe under pressure, Europe would eventually turn to liquid gas from other countries. If liquid gas or LNG is a solution, there are a few obvious potential suppliers, most notably the US and the state of Qatar. While neither could fill the shortfall of so much gas immediately, one analyst told me Qatar might be able to provide a more medium and long-term solution. The Qataris indeed did supply Europe with a lot more gas in the past, but given the fact that the Europeans were not very fond of the way that the contracts were structured, Qatar pivoted to Asia and now supplies for most of the gas to them rather than the Europeans. Should there be some, say, reconsideration on the European end when it comes to the contractual elements and their compatibility with European energy law, then, then this might actually change the situation, at least in the medium to long term. From the geopolitical perspective, there are increasingly loud voices in Western Europe who don't want to be so dependent on Russia for their energy supply. We have to build the foundations of our sovereignty, which means more independence from Russia. When I look at our imports in terms of oil and gas, we are not independent from Russia. This won't happen overnight. 
EU leaders have been clear that a Russian act of aggression against Ukraine would have dire consequences for President Putin and his country. It would mean an end to his hopes of switching on the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline, depriving him of tens of billions of dollars in revenue and depriving the EU of hundreds of billions of cubic meters of Russian gas. The view in Berlin is that such a price is worth paying if it can deter Moscow from invasion. Ministers here don't want to arm the Ukrainians. They believe their most potent weapon against Putin is sanctions, no matter the cost. Dominic Kane, Al Jazeera, in the German capital. The US ambassador to the United Nations pledged that the UN Security Council will press Russia hard in a Monday session to discuss Moscow's massing of troops near Ukraine and rising fears in its planning an invasion. Politicians in the US are debating what to do about Russia, which has more than 100,000 troops stationed on its border with Ukraine. Senators are close to reaching a deal on legislation that would spell out severe consequences if Russia's act. They say it is unlikely that the UN Security Council will take action when it meets on Monday. Al Jazeera's Patty Colhan reports from Washington, D.C. A massive show of force, tanks, artillery, more than 100,000 Russian troops. The U.S. military says this is now a strong enough force to take over the country of Ukraine. On Monday, the U.N. Security Council will put the issue front and center, with the U.S. ambassador saying she will try to make Russia feel isolated in the world. Our voices are unified in calling for uh, the Russians to explain themselves. We're, we're going to go in the room prepared to listen uh, to them, but we're, we're not uh, going to be distracted by their propaganda. And the Ukrainian ambassador to the U.S. is hoping to rally the international community as well with a warning. If Ukraine will be further attacked by Russia. Of course they will not stop in, in Ukraine, after Ukraine. But with Russia able to veto any action at the UN, this is likely to be more theater than a solution. But one prominent U.S. senator has a new suggestion, saying the U.S. can't give in to Russia's demands that Ukraine will not join NATO, but Ukraine can. But it's his decision to make. If he decides that the future membership, if there's to be one in NATO for Ukraine and the question of Russian occupation of Ukraine are two things to put on the table, uh, I think we may move toward a solution to this. This week, the U.S. Senate is expected to take up a bill that would spell out severe consequences if Russia acts. Which would include sanctions, which would include more military assistance, which would include helping them to fight back against the cyber attacks that the Russians uh, continue to use against Ukraine and also to help on the disinformation campaign that Russia is actively involved in to try to destabilize the Zelensky government. But the Biden administration wants to hold off on sanctions as a deterrent, hoping that the threat of freezing Russia out of the international banking system is enough to stop any military action, which Russia says it has no intention of taking. In Kiev on Sunday, a show of gratitude. Ukrainians take to the streets to send a message that they appreciate the support, even as many hope they won't need it. Patty Colhane, Al Jazeera, Washington. And before we end the news, a recap of our main headlines. Scorpion's arrival delayed. APRC calls on Barrow to revisit agreement sanctioning deployment of Senegalese troops in Fournier. Consortium of CSO's Election Work Committee issues recommendation as legislative election law. Jokadu Tambana circumcision tech center stage. And on the international scene, closing arguments begin in 1987 Sankara trial. As Russia Ukraine tensions escalate, EU scramble to secure gas supply. US Senate close to deal on a bill to sanction Russia over Ukraine tension. That's all for this edition of the news. Do join us tomorrow. For more news, please stay tuned and enjoy the rest of our programs. Thank you.